Welcome everyone to today's talk on infectious disease prevention in animal shelters. As you have likely seen, infectious disease can be life-threatening in the shelter environment. Even for diseases that shouldn't lead to death, diseases like ringworm, for shelters that, that don't have the resources to treat them, it can mean euthanasia. But there are steps that we can take to reduce disease in the shelter and therefore reduce that unnecessary euthanasia. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Infectious disease prevention is at the heart of life-saving. And of course, that's why we're all here, right? I'm Dr. Erin Katribe. I am medical director for Best Friends Animal Society. And I'm excited to talk to you today about infectious disease transmission and prevention in animal shelters. This is our roadmap for today. We'll first start by talking about disease transmission basics. Then we'll talk about preventing disease in the shelter and some strategies that you can use in any setting. Then we'll go into some specific diseases as well as some case examples. So in order to prevent disease, we have to understand how diseases are transmitted. So let's talk about that first. Disease transmission 101. Here are a few key points and definitions. First, incubation period. So this is defined as the number of days from when an animal is exposed to an infectious disease to when they start showing clinical signs or symptoms of that disease. It's important to know that healthy animals or animals that at least look healthy can actually be contagious. So what that means is animals that are still in this incubation period, meaning they've been exposed and they've been infected, but they're not yet showing any signs of that disease, Sometimes they are contagious during that incubation period, or particularly toward the, the later end of it. And so even though they look healthy, they can be incubating disease and they can actually be contagious. Pathogen, so this is defined as any virus, bacteria, parasite, any of the bugs that cause disease. We use the word pathogen as just an umbrella term to talk about any of those agents. And then it's important to know that some pathogens, uh, particularly ringworm or parvo or panluke, and we'll, we'll talk more about these specific diseases later, but some pathogens are extremely durable or extremely hardy in the environment. So how are diseases transmitted? Uh, it can be in a number of ways, uh, and I have many of those different ways listed here. It's different for different diseases, and it can be multiple of these for some, some pathogens. First is direct contact. So that means an animal coming into direct contact with another animal. And so that's a, one of the most common. Some diseases are sp spread by droplets, meaning, for example, when a cat sneezes, uh, we can have a droplet that's, that, that can go four to six feet. Other pathogens are, are transmitted via uh, aerosols, so airborne transmission, and those can go much further. Uh, when I think of the prime example of that, it's going to be canine kennel cough. So when dogs cough, they can aerosolize those particles and they can go up to 20 feet, so much further. Fecal oral transmission is another really important one. So this means feces in contact with oral or other mucous membranes. So the classic one here is going to be parvo, also panluke in cats. Uh, it doesn't have to be obvious feces, though. It, it can be viral particles that are shed in the feces. Uh, and even if all of the, the obvious feces is gone, if we still have some remnants uh, of those fecal particles or of those viral particles, uh, then that coming into contact with another animal can be contagious. We have fomites. So what, what are fomites? This is any object or a material that can potentially carry infection. What this means is the infectious agent is actually physically on that object and it carries it from one animal to another. The classic ones in the shelter setting are gonna be things like cleaning equipment food and water dishes, or the most common one is actually going to be us. Uh, I have in the, the picture here, so your face can be a fomite. Uh, even if we're wearing gloves and taking some, some various precautions, if we're putting our faces, if we're kissing kittens, uh, then your face can certainly be a fomite. And then the method of transmission is gonna be different for different diseases. Who is most at risk when we start talking about infectious disease? And so we have a couple of categories of animals that we really wanna focus on. The first one is gonna be young animals. And this is for a couple of different reasons. First of all, they just don't have as developed immune systems as adult animals do. They're still growing and they're still developing. Then we have uncertain vaccine efficacy 
due to something called maternal antibodies. We'll, we'll talk more about this in some later slides when we start talking about vaccines. Uh, but essentially, even if we're vaccinating appropriately, we those vaccines may or may not be effective in these animals early on. It's important to know these animals not only are the most vulnerable to infectious disease, but they are also the most likely to be contagious to others. And like we talked about a little bit earlier, uh, even healthy appearing animals can potentially be contagious. So the, the bright, happy, healthy looking kitten like you see in the picture here could actually be in its incubation period and could even be contagious with, with an infectious disease. The other group of animals that's gonna be most important or that we, we worry about being most at risk or most likely to be incubating disease is gonna be our new intakes. Um, and that's because they have an unknown vaccination status. They could have been exposed to an infectious disease before they enter the shelter and for some diseases potentially contagious if they're in that incubation period. So that's the basics on disease transmission. So how do we go about preventing disease in the shelter? Here are our three main buckets that I like to think about when I think about preventing infectious disease. First is preventing physical transmission. Second, enhancing the immune system to prevent infection. And then third is reducing the number of potential exposure points. Now, uh, we can all sort of think about this in terms of how uh, our public health response to COVID went. So physical is putting me up mechanical barriers so the pathogen can't get from one animal to the next. Uh, so that's reducing that direct animal to animal contact or reducing uh, indirect contact like on equipment or on our hands and things like that. Enhancing the immune system, the classic one here is gonna be vaccines, and then reducing the number of exposure points. So this is reducing the number of chances for that physical transmission to actually occur. So the, the great example is during the initial stages of our, the pandemic, we had lockdown, right? Where we were encouraged to stay home, so we didn't come in contact with other humans, and so we didn't have any potential exposure points. And we can apply those same principles to the animal shelter for preventing disease transmission there. I think it's important to understand or to keep in mind uh, how many animals are not protected from various diseases at the time of intake to the shelter. And so we do actually have some research that's been done that looks at this for a couple of different diseases. And so I've shared some of those numbers here. For parvovirus, 78% of puppies are not protected at the time that they come into the shelter. For canine distemper, it's 88% of puppies are unprotected. And even when we include adult dogs, it's still 57%. So over half of all dogs entering shelters in this particular study were not protected against distemper um, at the time of entry. One of our key strategies, and, and frankly, one of the most straightforward strategies to implement across different shelters for prevention of disease is going to be vaccination. And so we're gonna talk about that one first. Vaccination, of course, is not available for all diseases, but it's gonna be a, a key component of prevention for those diseases for which we have vaccines. When we talk about vaccination, you can have complete protection or you may only get partial protection. Uh, and, and that's gonna vary by disease. What I mean by complete protection is once that vaccine has been administered and the animal's immune system has fully responded, usually that takes uh, more than one dose of vaccine, but once they have fully responded to that vaccine, complete protection means that the that infection is prevented. Partial protection means they, it, they can still get infected even after that vaccine is fully on board, but the severity of their clinical signs or the duration of that disease may be less. So examples of this are for parvovirus uh, and, and for canine distemper. Once an animal has responded to their vaccine, they actually do get complete protection and, and they won't get infected with those diseases. Uh, for diseases like kennel cough, so we can vaccinate for Bordetella, uh, but that one only, that vaccine only provides partial protection. This is gonna be different for different diseases and different for different vaccines. When we think about vaccination in the shelter, it's gonna be crucial to vaccinate right at intake or even before intake happens if you have the opportunity to do that. The reason for this is that, that those vaccines start generating some protection within a few hours. That, that partial protection or that early protection is going to be less than what we get days or weeks later, but we, we do start to get some protection very, very early on, and that can mean the difference between life and death for some of these diseases. 
So this means we need to vaccinate immediately upon intake or even before if we can achieve that. Uh, because full protection will take weeks, uh, it also often takes second or additional doses of vaccine, even for adult animals that, that we can expect to respond to those initial doses. And so it's key that we give our second and additional doses of vaccine on time. Uh, and we'll talk about what the shelter vaccine guidelines are in, in a little bit. Again, full protection may take weeks or longer, uh, even for adult animals, and can take essentially months sometimes in puppies and kittens. Uh, and, and so it's really important to make sure we're giving these additional doses on time. Here's some other key points around vaccination. The type of vaccine matters. Whenever we have the option to give a modified live vaccine, that's what we want to use. Not recombinant, not killed vaccines. The reason for this is modified live vaccines stimulate a stronger immune response and they do it faster than any of the alternatives. We always want to vaccinate according to shelter guidelines, and we'll talk about what those are, but there are published guidelines for animal shelters, and these vaccine strategies and schedules are going to be different than they are for private practice, simply based on the higher risk environment that we have in shelters. We want to make sure that we're storing and that we're handling our vaccines appropriately. If we're not doing this, if we're not keeping our vaccines cold, uh, if we're not mixing them up appropriately, then they're not going to be as effective. And so it doesn't matter if we're vaccinating on the right schedule, uh, if we're not storing and handling those vaccines the right way. And then we want to use our shelter software to track what vaccines are given and to generate automated reminders for those additional doses that we talked about are so important. This, this means there's not room for human error and that animals won't get missed. Remember, full protection takes weeks and often multiple doses and any delay can contribute to an increased risk of disease. Let's talk about vaccinating young animals in particular. As we talked about, they are at higher risk for disease. This is because of underdeveloped immune systems, right? They're still developing, they're still growing, but it's also because of something called maternal antibodies. So what are maternal antibodies? Antibodies in general are, are components that, that float around in the bloodstream that our immune system produces and they're, they're aid in fighting off disease. So they're disease specific, meaning a, a dog will have different antibodies for parvo, a, a different antibodies for distemper and so on. So different for different diseases. And then maternal antibodies are antibodies from mom that are passed on to a puppy or kitten at birth or early nursing if mom was protected and had antibodies to that disease. These antibodies will provide early protection for that puppy or kitten. However, they decline over time they decline at an unpredictable rate. And, and so that can be really challenging. We, we don't know how quickly they decline. And that decline can actually be different even for puppies and kittens of the same litter. And we don't have a, a useful way to determine when that decline happens. To add to the, the dilemma, these maternal antibodies will also interfere with vaccination, meaning vaccines given when maternal antibodies are still hanging around will not be effective and that puppy or kitten will not start generating their own longer lasting antibodies. Again, that, that timing of decline is gonna be different for different individuals. And, but one thing that we do know is that for every individual, the latest is going to be 16 weeks of age. So that's when we know that no puppy or kitten is gonna have any maternal antibodies hanging around anymore. Uh, next up, I'm gonna use some graphs to, to illustrate this concept. And if you're into that, hang on. Uh, if I lose you, don't worry. We'll kind of summarize at the end. But, but I think this does a really nice job of sort of explaining what, what can be a really challenging concept. All right, so on the vertical axis, we have antibody level. And then on the, the horizontal axis, we have time. So starting at birth, we have maternal antibodies that start very high, essentially at birth for a puppy or kitten. And then over time, those maternal antibodies decline. This level of antibody here, this green line, is going to be the level of antibodies that we need or that puppy or kitten needs for protection against this particular disease. And as we talked about, when we have maternal antibodies hanging around, they interfere with vaccination. The challenge is that the level of maternal antibody that is, is necessary for protection is higher than the level that interferes with vaccination. And this is going to be really important. We'll come back to this. 
So those maternal antibodies wane over time. So let's get this puppy or kitten protected. Let's start vaccinating, right? We know that those maternal antibodies can start declining really early in some animals, or if mom wasn't protected, they may not have any antibodies at all. So we start vaccinating around four weeks of age, and we ideally we get that puppy or kitten's own antibody, vaccine-induced antibody, which is the purple line here, uh, trending upward, right? Well, unfortunately, it is not that simple. When maternal antibodies are still above this red line, they inactivate that vaccine. So we don't get any vaccine-induced antibody. So we start vaccinating here and we vaccinate again here and, and those maternal antibodies are still above that red line. And so we're not getting any vaccine induced protection. At the time of the second vaccine, we've dropped below that level of, of maternal antibody needed for protection. But again, our maternal antibodies are still interfering with our vaccine. So our puppy or kitten isn't protected anymore from using its maternal antibodies, but we're not getting any vaccine induced antibodies yet. Vaccinate again here and same thing. We're, we're still above that red line. So we're not generating any vaccine antibodies. And it's not until here with this purple arrow. This is the first time that our maternal antibodies have now dropped below that red line. And so that is when we actually start generating some of those vaccine induced antibodies. We booster again here, and, and that's when we finally start to get above that antibody level needed for protection. So we were above that green line now. And so that puppy or kitten has now made its own vaccine induced antibodies that will protect it from disease. Clinically, what this means, and the most important thing about all of this is during the time between these two red dotted lines that you see here, uh, from when maternal antibodies drop below that green line to when our purple line, our vaccine-induced antibodies are above that green line, our puppy or kitten is not protected against this disease. And so we call that our window of susceptibility. The goal of, va of vaccine schedules in the shelter or any high-risk setting is to try to reduce that window as much as possible. So, if, if the graphs were too much, come back to me and we'll kind of summarize up here. The, the key thing of all of this is we cannot consider young animals protected until they've had two vaccines given when they're 16 weeks or older. And so depending on what that timing looks like, it's, it's usually when they are 18 weeks of age or older, de depending again on, on when we've started and what that schedule looks like. We know all maternal antibodies have waned by 16 weeks of age in, in every animal. And so we know that any vaccines that we give at 16 weeks or older is, are going to be effective. Maybe in, in a particular animal, maternal antibodies will have started to wane earlier than that. And that's why we start so early, uh, trying to get that lasting protection earlier in those animals, but it, the, it, they may have still had maternal antibodies hanging around. And so the assumption that we have to make is that they're not protected. We have to handle these young animals. We have to handle vulnerable animals as if they could catch disease at any point and as if they could develop disease at any time that we could potentially spread to other animals. The number of vaccines that they've had does not matter. This is what I see in shelters and, and in rescue groups that I work with all the time is, is they'll make a comment like, oh, well, the, you know, this puppy's had two vaccines. It means it's protected. And, and we don't know that. The number of vaccines doesn't matter because we don't know when those maternal antibodies have declined. Here is a chart that compares vaccine schedules for shelter pets versus owned pets because they're going to be different. And, and the goal here is we start vaccinating earlier and we vaccinate more frequently in order to reduce that window of susceptibility um, that we get because of maternal antibodies. So for shelter pets, we start at four weeks of age versus six weeks of age with owned pets. We give vaccines more frequently. So every two to three weeks versus an interval of four weeks with owned pets. And we vaccinate a little bit longer. So 18 to 20 weeks with shelter pets versus just greater than 16 weeks with owned. And then even for adults, we always wanna give a second dose of vaccine for DHPP and for FERCP versus owned pets where we don't always do that. Here's what the shelter guidelines look like for, uh, for dogs. It's, it's going to be an initial DHPP for adults on intake. Uh, a second dose in two weeks, and then reboostering annually. For puppies, they get that initial dose on intake or when they uh, grow to four weeks of age, if we intake them sooner than that. 
And then we're going to repeat that every two to three weeks until they're 18 to 20 weeks of age. Bordetella, we just give once at intake. Uh, at four weeks of age or older, and then we repeat that one annually, and then rabies. So uh, while rabies is required legally, uh, it's it's not a disease that in most cases they're actually at risk of getting in the shelter. And so that one, um, we, we don't worry about as much in terms of disease transmission, uh, but still important to give. So starting at three to four months of age, depending on the legal requirements, then give, give an additional dose in a year, then it usually moves to an, a three-year schedule. But again, this can differ uh, state by state or jurisdiction by jurisdiction. For cats, the schedule looks pretty similar. It's an FERCP for adults on intake, and then a second dose in two weeks, then we can move to an annual schedule. For kittens, initial dose on intake are at four weeks of age, and then repeating that every two to three weeks again until they're 18 to 20 weeks of age. With, with this, it's important that we give an injectable FERCP, so not an intranasal vaccine alone. Uh, and again, we wanna use a modified live vaccine versus alternative options. Some vaccines in include chlamydia, uh, and it's that is not something necessarily that we need in our vaccine. Same thing with rabies, right? It's going to be three to four months, then in a year, then usually every three years, depending on legal restrictions and depending on, on the vaccine that you're using. Like we talked about, uh, if you're if we're vaccinating on an appropriate schedule, it's going to be key that we store and handle our vaccines appropriately. Otherwise, our vaccines are not going to be effective. We, these vaccines need to stay refrigerated and in shelters, we love to be efficient and put these little mini fridges in our intake areas or in our medical areas. And, and this may be appropriate to store vaccines temporarily, maybe, uh, but ultimately they're not generally recommended. And the reason for this is every time you open these little mini fridges, they potentially get, the temperature goes up. Uh, we have to keep our vaccines below the recommended temperature. And so no matter where you're storing them, it's important to monitor the temperature minimum and maximum. If you are using one of these mini fridges, you can get little thermometers that will track the min and max over a 24 hour period. And so you can make sure that your vaccines are staying within the, within the recommended range. For any vaccines that come, uh, for example, like FERCP or the DHPP that you have to mix up so the powder and the liquid come separately, it's important to wait until right before you're administering those vaccines to mix them. Depending on the vaccine, uh, it's anywhere from 30 minutes to 60 minutes that they're effective after mixing. Uh, again, we like to be really efficient in shelters and we do things like mix up all the vaccines that we're gonna need for the day. Well, unfortunately, those vaccines are no longer good after about 30 minutes to an hour. So we need to mix those up right before we administer them. If we are taking a large number of vaccines out into the shelter, for example, to administer you know, second doses of vaccine, we always wanna keep them in a cooler while we're, we're taking them out into the shelter. However, it's important to not allow them to freeze either. So that means don't set them directly on those ice packs that you have in your cooler, have some sort of buffer. Uh, and then I always recommend for shelters, if you find out that your vaccines got out of the recommended temperature range, uh, I've had this happen to me when we've had power outages, I always recommend contacting the manufacturer. Oftentimes, even if it's um, not due to anything that they did, they actually will replace those vaccines at no cost to you. So if you have an incident happen, like the power goes out or vaccines don't get unpacked on time, uh, if so that box is sitting in the lobby and, and those vaccines get outside of that, that recommended range, all the ice packs melt, uh, give your manufacturer, your distributor a call and see if you can't get some of that replaced. Next up in terms of preventing disease is going to be sanitation. So this is going to be about preventing physical transmission. Sanitation is defined as the two steps First cleaning, followed by disinfection. So cleaning is the actually mechanical removal of debris. And then disinfection is what we do with, with our disinfectant products. There are different disinfectants, so different classes and types of products. Uh, and one of the things that, that is variable between classes of disinfectants is going to be whether or not they work in the presence of organic material. What's organic material? Well, and for our purposes, essentially you can think of it as food or poop. All of those things are organic material. Some products are touted as one-step products, meaning they work in the presence of organic material, but the disinfectant still needs to actually make contact with the surface. So if you have uh, food or poop that's actually caked on, 
that disinfectant is not actually making contact with that, that surface, you cannot disinfect poop. And so really there's no such thing as a true one-step product. We have to remove all of the obvious debris first in the cleaning step, and then we disinfect. Different disinfectants have efficacy against different pathogens. And so it's gonna be important to make sure that the disinfectant that we choose is effective against the pathogens that we're worried about. Uh, and the dilution that we use our disinfectant at is, is going to be important. We have to measure every single time. We can't eyeball it. We can't just pour a little bit into our spray bottle and add some water uh, or into our mop bucket. We have to measure every time or use a commercial dilution system. Uh, so those foamer systems. So we know that that dilution is appropriate. And then contact time is, is gonna be important for disinfection. That disinfectant has to sit wet on the surface or on the object that we're trying to disinfect for the full contact time in order for it to be effective. This is a, a lovely disinfectant quick reference that looks at various classes of disinfectants and looks at their efficacy as well as their dilutions and their contact time. Now, we can make this available. Um, it is available readily online through ASPCA Pro, but I wanna call out something that's really important here. I mentioned earlier, some of our pathogens are really, really durable in the environment, meaning they're hard to kill. Uh, if we don't disinfect appropriately, those pathogens can hang around for days, weeks, or even months. And on this chart, it, it's going to be this section that's, that asks, are they effective? Are these disinfectants effective against non-enveloped viruses? For the ones that we worry about in the shelter are essentially going to be parvo, panluc, and Khaleesi virus. These are all non-enveloped viruses, and they're all really hard in the environment. A key thing here to mention is quaternary ammonium compounds, uh, also known as quads, that's something we say for shorthand. Even though many quads will say on their label that they're effective against these viruses, when we actually do the independent research, uh, that they are not reliably effective. And so that's going to be really, really important. Generally, the disinfectant that I recommend for shelters, and there are multiple different disinfectants that are effective against uh, the pathogens that we worry about, uh, but for a number of reasons, rescue, which is an accelerated hydrogen peroxide compound, uh, is one of the ones that, that I find is, is most effective and, and most useful in shelters. And this is an example of a use and dilution chart that we can use in shelters. You'll see the, the dilution that we use and the contact time is going to be different depending on the risk of the area. So daily cleaning and in lower settings, we can use a lower dilution and a shorter contact time, but know that that's not effective against those hardier pathogens. When we use it at a higher dilution, uh, the contact time is going to be 10 minutes for that 1 to 32 dilution, and, and that it is effective against those pathogens at, at that dilution, though we do need a full 10 minutes of contact time. And if we up the dilution, then we can reduce that contact time down to five minutes. And so uh, this one is the one that we recommend for known disease areas. So our isolation areas have a known outbreak. Uh, and, and certainly, because we're using it at this higher dilution, it's going to be twice as expensive but sometimes that reduction in contact time that you need uh, is going to make all of the difference and, and maybe worth it. So that's also an option for routine deep cleaning, but it's that greater expense. Uh, again, this is just an example of a chart uh, and, and we'll provide that in the resources. Next up, biosecurity. So we talked about cleaning and disinfection. So biosecurity is also fall, it falls into that bucket of preventing physical transmission. Biosecurity is anything essentially that we do to reduce disease transmission. When I talk about biosecurity in the shelter, I mean things like hand hygiene and the use of personal protective equipment. So PPE, uh, what is PPE? Examples of PPE are things like gloves. Uh, it might be gowns or towels or blankets. And so in general, in the shelter setting, I recommend gloves and gowns when we're dealing with any high risk animals. Uh, it may not have to be a gown if we're just you know, doing routine handling of a puppy or kitten. It can be something as simple as throwing a blanket over that animal so we're not contaminating our full bodies when we, we pick up that puppy or kitten. Uh, it's important whenever we're using PPE to, to know how to properly put on and take off, so donning and doffing, uh, of that equipment. Uh, that, that personal protective equipment doesn't do any good if we take those gloves off or take that gown off in a way that then contaminates our hands or contaminates our body. 
And then it's also key to change our PPE in between individual animals. Again, gloves or PPE doesn't do any good if we are using the same PPE when we're moving on to a different individual. Uh, I have a picture of hand sanitizer on the, the photo here, or on the slide here. And, and my uh, recommendation on hand sanitizer is, is not to use these for staff in animal shelters. And the reason for that is it does not pro provide reliable efficacy against those hardier pathogens that we talked about. Uh, they may have a place when we start talking about, you know, staff versus the public, but for individuals that are going to have heavy contact potentially with infected or high risk animals, a hand sanitizer is not something that we recommend. I also have a picture of a foot bath here on the slide. Uh, and as you can imagine, we talked about contact time, right? So standing in a foot bath, you'd have to stand for that full contact time in that foot bath. And so uh, unless you have five or 10 minutes to stand around in a foot bath, those foot baths are not gonna be reliably effective. And so I recommend either dedicated footwear for those high risk areas or actually utilizing shoe covers. So foot baths, not reliably effective. And in general, we don't recommend them. And in addition to that, oftentimes when I see them actually being used in shelters, they are simply like areas for collection of uh, debris and food and, and poop and things like that. When we talk about biosecurity and we talk about sort of levels of risk, um, I think it's important for shelters in some situations, we, we can actually start to distinguish which animals are higher risk. So like we talked about, the big buckets of animals I worry about are gonna be young animals and then new intakes. In some shelters where there is a lot of infectious disease, it may mean that we have to take extra precautions with every single animal. And this, this again, it just depends on the disease risk in the individual shelter. Uh, I think sometimes we can just make the distinction between staff versus the public. Uh, for example, with hand sanitizer, right? I don't recommend that for staff because they're much more likely to be contaminated, uh, but maybe that makes sense to encourage your public to use. If we can't get our public to wash their hands between every animal or wear gloves and we don't have the staff to oversee that to make sure they're doing those things, maybe providing that hand sanitizer and, and asking them to do that, we can get some compliance with that. And so I'd rather they have uh, they comply with a lesser measure than not comply with, with the, the best recommendations. And then biosecurity and foster homes. And so I think this one is going to be dependent on what the foster home looks like. Uh, I know that when I foster animals in my own home, uh, it's it's not that much better than a shelter in a lot of situations. I take home the ones that are really sick and potentially do have infectious disease. And I may have multiple litters in my house at the same time. However, for the average foster home, we may not need to make such stringent recommendations. In my home, I do try to use biosecurity in between different litters. But again, for, for a household that only has one litter of kittens that are generally healthy, uh, that may not be necessary. And then I bring up uh, during surgery on here. So surgery days are a really common place in shelters where I see a lot of cross-contamination happening. We have a lot of animals to get through in a really short period of time. Uh, many of them, though, are our most vulnerable animals. There are puppies and our kittens. And so we really need to make sure that we're taking these precautions during surgery. Uh, next is cleaning and handling order, right? And so again, this is talking about reducing physical transmission, particularly when we're talking about staff as fomites. So reducing that transmission of disease on staff. Ideally, we have separate staff that deal with separate populations. And I have our, our kind of four buckets of different populations of animals here on the slide. Uh, if that is not possible, so if it's not possible to have dedicated staff for each of these, then we need to start with the most vulnerable and or the lowest risk animals first, and then end with the least vulnerable or the highest risk animals later. And so that means the cleaning order is going to be healthy or more vulnerable. So our healthy puppies and kittens first, followed by our apparently healthy but less vulnerable adults. Uh, if we have animals that appear healthy right now, but we know we're exposed to infectious disease, so they could break at any time. We call that quarantine. They look healthy, but they could be incubating disease. So that's gonna be that third population or third in our cleaning order. Uh, and then lastly, we, we do our obviously six, our animals in isolation, we do those animals last. Next, we're going to talk about animal flow. And so this falls in the bucket of reducing potential exposure points. So that third bucket of our strategies for prevention of disease transmission in the shelter. So 
things that we can do in terms of animal flow in our shelters to reduce the risk of disease is going to be to reduce overcrowding and density, and to reduce animal movement. And I'm gonna demonstrate that with this, this little graphic here. So we have a full shelter. Every single dog run is full, like you see in the, with the little icons here. And that orange dog in the center is gonna be our sick dog. And this dog starts coughing. And like we talked about, uh, kennel cough in dogs can be aerosolized. And so it can travel up to 20 feet. And so when this dog coughs, he potentially exposes all of these other dogs that you see here. So this is, say this is a 20 foot radius. And so he's coughing and so he exposes his neighbors and a couple of dogs down the way and the dogs across the aisle. And so all of these dogs potentially can get sick. So they, they get exposed to that kennel cough from that initial dog. When we have a crowded shelter, it's all of these dogs that get exposed. If we compare that to a situation where we, we may not have every kennel full, that same coughing dog only exposes this many dogs, right? So there's, there's empty kennels and so not as many animals get exposed. And so as you can see, when our density is less, our disease transmission is going to be less. When we start to talk about movement, so that dog started coughing and he exposed uh, all of his, his neighbors, the ones that were within that, that 20 foot range, and, and his neighbor gets moved, but, but maybe his neighbor gets moved when he still looks healthy. And so we didn't know that this dog was going to get sick. So he moves over here. And then when he does break with infectious disease or he breaks with that kennel cough, he then can transmit that 20 feet. And so then he exposes these additional dogs beyond who the first dog exposed, right? So these dogs now potentially get sick. And so whenever we think about animal flow in the shelter setting, because we can have dogs that are contagious, that, that don't look obviously contagious, uh, we, we can reduce those disease exposure points by reducing that movement. So if it's possible to leave dogs into the, in the same run, and so their neighbors stay the same, uh, then that can reduce our, our risk of disease transmission. This also means avoiding commingling of unrelated animals. So essentially any animals that are not litter mates or that didn't actually come into the shelter to, together, uh, if we avoid commingling of those animals, then, then that can reduce those potential exposure points. This sometimes happens in, in crowded or busy shelters when we're approaching capacity. And so we double up dogs and runs. And, and if possible, we want to avoid that. It's that density issue, right? If one of those dogs gets sick, uh, then that other dog is likely to get sick too. What does this mean for play groups? And, and so I, I want to talk specifically about that because something that I say about sheltering is that everything that we do is about balancing risk and life-saving. And so when I think about the risk of dogs in a play group, uh, I, and I think about, you know, unrelated dogs commingling, uh, it, it's in an outdoor play yard. It's, it's heavily ventilated and it's usually only for 20 or 30 minutes. And so the risk there is much, much, much less than the risk of two dogs living 24 seven, sharing a run together. We, we can also do things to select dogs that are going to be lower risk. So for example, we're, we're only going to choose healthy appearing dogs. We're not going to choose anybody that's obviously sick. And potentially this means we don't do play groups with our puppies because they are going to be the most vulnerable and the most likely to be carrying infectious disease. Uh, certainly, if there is a lot of infectious disease in the shelter, either in a particular shelter or for a particular time, perhaps we, we pause those play groups. And, and so we don't do play groups when we're dealing with infectious disease. And then the last sort of concept or strategy to think about in terms of animal flow is going to be reducing length of stay. And we'll talk about that more in depth coming up. So what is length of stay? Length of stay is defined as the length of time. And typically we measure that in number of days. And so it's the length of time or, that an animal spends in the shelter. Why does length of stay matter? Well, it is hands down the most important risk factor for many infectious diseases that we see in the shelter. The longer an animal spends in the shelter, the, the greater their risk of getting exposed to an infectious disease and the greater their chances of, of contracting that disease. Their time in the shelter also leads to increased stress, which can then suppress their immune system. Uh, additionally, it, their behavior can decline the longer they spend in the shelter. 
Certainly, the longer they spend in the shelter, uh, it's an increased cost to care for them, both in terms of, of materials as well as staff labor. And the longer each individual animal spends in the shelter, uh, it, it means a decreased capacity over time for the shelter. And I'll illustrate that with uh, a super duper simple example, but um, you know, hey, bear with me. So uh, super simple math here, right? That's the, the point of this. So we have shelter A that has 10 cat kennels. In shelter A, cats spend an average of seven days in the shelter. So their average length of stay is seven days. How many cats can we care for in one week in shelter A? And, and every cat stays for a week and we only have 10 kennels, so we can only care for 10 cats. In shelter B, also only 10 cat kennels, but this shelter has, has done some, some work to reduce their average length of stay and cats in their care only stay for an average of one day. So how many cats can, can this shelter care for in one week? And this shelter can care for 70 cats. So when we look at capacity over time, if we reduce our length of stay, it means we can care for more animals and ultimately means we can save more lives. What are some strategies to decrease length of stay? Uh, and so, and, and I have some of them listed here. Uh, it's fast tracking. So essentially this means identifying your animals that are the most highly adaptable and, and getting them through the shelter system as quickly as possible. So doing what we need to do to move them through more quickly. Uh, as a bonus, again, it's our puppies and kittens that are most susceptible to disease and they are also some of our most adaptable. So really identifying those guys early and trying to get them through the system. We can reconsider quarantine periods. So the an old old way of thinking was that, well, gosh, we don't want to adopt out a sick animal. So let's hang on to animals in the shelter, make sure they don't break with any disease before we allow them to be adopted. And, and actually, by keeping them in the shelter, the shelter is the most dangerous place. We, we should be moving these animals through as quickly as possible and reducing their length of stay. So reconsidering quarantine periods outside of some very specific instances where we may know we have infectious disease exposure, we don't wanna be hanging on to these animals. We, we use all of the strategies that we're talking about today to prevent disease, right? If animals actually do get sick, it means they stay in the shelter longer while we treat them. Uh, we wanna identify and remove any bottlenecks. So a, a really common one for a lot of shelters that I work with is gonna be surgery. Uh, if we can't get these animals spayed and neutered, then we can't get them out of the shelter. So it's figuring out either how to increase that, that capacity or, or remove that bottleneck altogether. So can we adopt them out and, and have them come back for surgery at a later date? It's managed intake. So managed intake is scheduling our, our intake periods uh, when we know we might have more capacity at the shelter or asking folks to hang on to animals for a little bit of time so, so they have some time to work on alternative uh, ways of rehoming. Uh, it's open selection. So for animals that are subject to stray holds, we, it doesn't mean we have to hide them from the public during that stray hold. We can still show them to the public, make them uh, potentially available, and folks can express their interest. And so then the, the moment that stray hold is up, that person can come forward and get that animal out of the shelter. And then daily population rounds. And so there, we have lots of resources uh, on our network page around daily population rounds. But essentially, this is it's a strategy to proactively manage the shelter population involving staff members from various departments so we can keep that population moving uh, and, and we can work on all of these strategies that we're talking about. Another way to reduce exposure points of animals is to make sure that we're isolating any animals demonstrating signs of infectious disease really, really rapidly. We wanna recognize signs of disease quickly and then pull those animals out of general population. These animals are the most contagious and so we need to get them away so they're not exposing other animals. Uh, isolating sick animals, rapidly identifying and then isolating, that's how we prevent a single case of kennel cough, as an example, from turning into a widespread outbreak. Uh, if you don't have a dedicated isolation space in your shelter, it's considering things like foster care. So we can isolate animals in foster care. Uh, when we have those sick animals, we, and we want to confirm in some cases. So in, depending on the disease and depending on the clinical signs, uh, knowing what specific pathogen is causing that disease may or may not be important. Uh, for example, if you are worried about distemper, uh, this has a longer incubation period than other causes of kennel cough, and it can look just like kennel cough. And so if we're worried about distemper, it may be important to, to confirm and to know that's the cause of, of clinical signs in a particular animal. 
Uh, if, if it's just run of the mill kennel cough, it may not matter if it's Bordetella or another pathogen, if we're going to treat and handle those animals the same. Uh, so, but, you know, in some instances, confirming that diagnosis is important. When we have animals that we know were exposed to that sick animal, we want to monitor them closely to see if they're going to demonstrate signs of disease and if they're going to get sick. And then we want to avoid exposing new animals to the sick animal or to the exposed animals. It's important to note that disease prevention in the shelter setting starts even before those animals come into the shelter in some instances. A common exposure point that I see in shelters is when is that they get exposed on the animal control vehicle, either because they, they get put into direct contact with other animals or because those animal control trucks are not being sanitized appropriately or their equipment isn't being sanitized appropriately. Uh, and again, that's cleaning and then disinfection with appropriate dilution and full contact time. Another way that prevention can start before intake is if we're using managed intake programs. So intake diversion, making it such that those animals don't even have to come into the shelter in the first place will reduce their risk of infectious disease and reduce the risk that they're gonna bring in infectious disease into the shelter. Uh, postponing intake, if we can, Let's let's get those animals in, get them vaccinated and have them go back into the home uh, so that vaccine can start to take effect before they actually have to enter the physical shelter. Uh, or with intake by appointment, we, we have the time and the space to have a conversation with that with that client that's bringing in that animal to determine, is it possible that this animal it was exposed to infectious disease? Are they demonstrating any signs of infectious disease now? Uh, and we can also potentially schedule that intake for a time when the shelter is less full, so there's less crowding. And then we, again, we reduce those exposure points. Again, super important, we can recognize disease based on the history, uh, as long as our admission staff are asking the right questions. All right, some key points to, to wrap up around strategies for prevention. Lives are at stake when it comes to infectious disease. Uh, diseases like parvo and panluc can absolutely be fatal, even if we have the resources to treat them, and especially if we don't. And then even diseases like ringworm, because they can be really challenging to manage in a shelter environment, you know, animals' lives can be at risk because of even those non-fatal diseases as well. Disease prevention is important at every stage, and it is everybody's responsibility. It just takes one person to spread disease, and then ultimately dogs and cats can end up losing their lives because of it. When we talk about strategies for prevention, it includes lots of different buckets of, of those strategies. It includes biosecurity and sanitation. Uh, it's vaccination, so immediately on, on intake, if not before, and it's ensuring we're giving those second doses on time. It's reducing length of stay, so reducing the amount of time that animals spend in the shelter at all, so they're, they're so we can avoid exposure. And then it's reducing movement and overcrowding in the shelter to again reduce those exposure points. All right, now let's talk about some specific diseases. Let's apply all of these strategies to diseases that we commonly see in the shelter environment. First, we'll talk about canine infectious respiratory disease, also known as kennel cough. Kennel cough is caused by potentially a combination of different viruses and or bacteria. Classically, what we see is, is cough, uh, as well as we might see nasal or ocular discharge, like you see in the photos here. Transmission, certainly by direct contact. So when sick dogs come into contact with other dogs, uh, it can also be transmitted by fomites. And so remember, that's equipment or people that transmit that, that pathogen. So I go and touch one dog that, that has kennel cough, and then I get that pathogen on my hand, and then I go and touch another dog. And I am the fomite in that example, and I transmitted that disease. The most challenging in the shelter environment when it comes to infectious respiratory disease in dogs is going to be that dogs can aerosolize their kennel cough pathogens up to 20 feet. And so when I think about a crowded shelter situation, that is that that dog's neighbors, uh, their neighbors across the aisle, the run, the run that they share the back wall with, right? So 20 feet uh, can expose a lot of dogs in a, in a dense shelter setting. Incubation for kennel cough, so the amount of time from when a dog is exposed to when they demonstrate those clinical signs is typically less than a week. And in most cases, our run-of-the-mill kennel cough pathogens are, are usually self-limiting, meaning the disease will run its course in an individual dog and that dog will recover without treatment. 
There are some notable exceptions, particularly when we start talking about puppies or canine distemper, which we'll talk about separately coming up next. So a key uh, thing to note about canine distemper is in the vast majority of cases, it can actually look just like kennel cough. Uh, we don't always get those classic neurological signs. In fact, those, those neurological signs only happen in about 10% of cases. Distemper is, uh, it definitely can cause more severe disease and, and that those cases may progress to pneumonia. And so clinically what that looks like is dogs that are, you know, have a really moist, wet cough and then progress to actual difficulty breathing. We can also see gastrointestinal signs. So things like vomiting or diarrhea. But again, for especially for adult dogs that they may have some protection and have really solid immune systems, it can look just like a canine, regular canine infectious respiratory disease or kennel cough. Transmission of canine distemper. So similarly to uh, kennel cough, it can be direct contact and fomites as well as aerosolization. Uh, it's also shed in the urine and the feces. So we have to be aware of, of our cleaning protocols and how that drainage is happening and aware that there can be viral particles in, in all of those body fluids. One of the challenging things about distemper is it has a longer incubation period. It's typically 10 to 14 days in most cases. And so that can be really challenging. So a dog can come in incubating distemper, be in the shelter for over a week before they start to show signs of it. Uh, but they can also be contagious before they start to show those clinical signs. And so they've already potentially exposed other dogs by the time they start showing those clinical signs. We can confirm our diagnosis if we're worried about distemper with PCR testing. So this is a, a respiratory swab that, that checks for the DNA of the virus. Uh, one thing to note, if we're using modified Lyme vaccines in the shelter, like we recommend and like is really important, uh, it is possible to get positive PCR results with vaccination. This happens in about 20% of healthy dogs but it only happens for one to two weeks after vaccination with a modified live vaccine. We have to use caution if we know we have distemper in our shelter or if we're worried about it and we have to treat every positive as real. Uh, but if we retest those dogs in about a week, their test will be negative at that time. So we have to be cautious and treat them as if it's a real positive, but we can distinguish between vaccine induced positives by retesting. What's the prognosis with distemper? Uh, this is a disease that I, I'll be honest with you. I was taught in school that it's it's always fatal. You might as well just euthanize if you're worried about distemper. And in fact, that is absolutely not the case. Uh, adults, in my experience, we can get 80 to 90% survival when we treat them. Uh, and in many, many cases, they don't get very sick. It looks just like kennel cough and we can treat them similarly. My experience with puppies has been not as great. Uh, I would say probably about 50%, uh, but th that is still far from a, an absolute death sentence. And so in the picture here, I have uh, three, three dogs that were distemper survivors that were puppies when they, when they got sick. Uh, shedding can be for weeks to months. And so this poses a big challenge in the shelter setting. Uh, and I am a huge proponent of utilizing foster care for dogs that are recovering, even though they may still be contagious. We can put them into foster care either with no other dogs or with fully vaccinated adult dogs because our vaccine for distemper is really, really, really good. It's really effective and it completely prevents infection in dogs that respond to it. The one good thing we have about distemper is that it is not one of those durable pathogens that we talked about earlier. It's not very long lived in the environment. Uh, it's only a few hours at room temperature. Now, this is still plenty of time to be transmitted indirectly via fomites via us, um, but at least it, it's not as hardy as uh, other illnesses that we'll talk about uh, coming up next. Canine parvovirus. So the common clinical signs we see with parvo, as many of you likely know, are going to be vomiting uh, and diarrhea, sometimes with blood in either one, and then lethargy and a decreased appetite. Uh, when, when I think about puppies in the shelter setting, if I see a puppy that's even the slightest bit dumpy, uh, I have parvo on the radar until it's proven otherwise. And so essentially I'm looking for a reason to parvo test. They are contagious before clinical signs start. So the puppy that looks bright and, and bouncy and happy could actually be shedding parvo. And so this is a great example of why it's important to handle all of our pediatric animals with precaution. So utilizing that PPE, using gloves, gowns, or even just throw a blanket over that puppy. 
Transmission is going to be either direct, so animals coming into contact with other animals, or is shed in the feces, and so coming into contact with infected feces or the remnants of contaminated feces if we're not disinfecting appropriately. We have a great test that we can run uh, right in the shelter, and so I have an example of one of those here, so this canine uh, parvovirus snap test. Uh, and, and they shed, so meaning they're contagious, for uh, up to about two weeks after initial infection. The challenge with parvo is that this is one of those durable viruses, and so it can live for months in the environment if we're not appropriately disinfecting. Feline panleukopenia is a very similar virus to canine parvo. It's in the, it's the same category of viruses, uh, and in a lot of ways it's really similar, although this one infects cats instead of dogs. Same transmission, so either direct or through feces. And just like parvo, it is very hardy in the environment. Again, meaning we need to, to disinfect thoroughly if we're going to get rid of this. Uh, the challenge with panluc is it, it is shed for a little bit longer than canine parvo is. And in my experience clinically, uh, it tends to be more difficult to treat. I do find we have a lot of success, like 90% or greater with puppies when we, we start treating for parvo uh, in terms of survival. Uh, and I do feel like it's less than that in kittens, although we can be successful with many of them. Key thing here is I recommend testing any vomiting kitten. So same thing as with puppies and parvo, uh, any dumpy kitten, Panluc has to be on the radar. Uh, puppies uh, can, can eat weird things or can scarf their food too fast and will vomit just because of that. Um, but kittens are much less likely to vomit for those benign reasons. And so any vomiting kitten, I recommend uh, that we, we need to think about Panluc. The keys for parvo and Panluc prevention are going to be vaccination, like we talked about with our puppies and kittens who are most at risk for these diseases, uh, vaccine may not be effective right away because of the maternal antibody presence. This means we can't consider the puppies or kittens protected until they're, they've had two vaccines at, at greater than 16 weeks of age. And so this means we need to be using our biosecurity uh, with any susceptible animals. And so that means PPE with all of our young animals, all of our puppies and kittens. Uh, and this also means we need effective sanitation, potentially in all areas of the shelter, certainly where we have known disease or instances of known disease, but really because these bugs live forever, weeks or months or, or longer in the environment, uh, any area that's not completely disinfected, we could potentially track that pathogen to a different part of the shelter and potentially expose susceptible animals. Next is feline upper respiratory disease. And, and so feline upper respiratory disease, uh, not unlike canine kennel cough, is caused by a potentially a combination of viruses and bacteria. But in the shelter setting, most 80 to 90% of feline upper respiratory disease is actually caused by either herpes virus or Khaleesi virus. So those are our two primary viral pathogens. We have some other bacteria that can cause primary disease potentially. And then we also can get some secondary bacterial infections. Key point here, so we do vaccinate for herpes virus and Khaleesi virus, but this is an instance of a vaccine that does not completely prevent infection. It only provides partial protection. So it can reduce the severity of clinical signs uh, and the duration, but it won't completely prevent infection, even in animals that have had a chance to, to fully respond to the vaccine. The biggest challenge with upper respiratory disease in cats and shelters is that healthy cats carry these pathogens. If we actually test over 50% in some settings of healthy appearing cats, we'll test positive for these bugs in, depending on the study and depending on the shelter. But not all of these cats will get sick and not all of them have to. Uh, this is a disease of stress. It's stress and time in the shelter that, that really cause cats to get sick with this disease. Uh, transmission is going to be through direct contact uh, and through fomites. Clinically, we, we don't actually see droplet or airborne transmission. It is typically that direct contact or uh, us transmitting it on equipment or ourselves. Again, when we, you know, 50% or more of healthy cats can have these pathogens at the time of intake, uh, we want to reduce spread of those bugs whenever we can through sanitation. But because so many of these cats have these bugs, uh, we're never going to get rid of them in our shelter populations. And so really, when we actually do the research and we look at what, what cats get sick and, and what shelters have cats that get sick, uh, it's factors like length of stay, how long that cat is in the shelter, the stress that that cat is going through, housing size uh, matters. 
Greater than eight feet of floor space per cat is actually protective against upper respiratory disease in shelters. So housing can impact infectious disease and in, in particularly when it comes to upper respiratory in cats. Uh, the, the photo there shows a, a kennel that has a double compartment or a portal to the kennel next door. And that's such a great way that we can provide low stress housing for cats. It gives them more floor space and we can shut the cat on one side of that portal in order to do some spot cleaning to change that litter box or to provide that food without pulling that cat out of that kennel. Because as it turns out, decreasing movement of cats also will reduce their risk of upper respiratory infection. When we look at risk factors, those cats being moved two or fewer times in their first week of stay in the shelter actually reduces their chances of upper respiratory infection. This includes moves for cleaning. So if we have to pull those cats out and put them into a carrier in order to clean, that increases their stress and that in turn increases their risk of, of infectious respiratory disease. Uh, again, we because not all cats are infected and because different cats may have different pathogens, we do want to reduce that physical transmission as much as possible. And so sanitation is still important when it comes to these bugs. Uh, some of these path pathogens are really hard in the environment. So again, it's appropriate disinfection, something that's effective against the bugs we're worried about uh, and using it at the appropriate dilution and for the appropriate contact time. Uh, we actually have a recorded webinar about infectious respiratory disease management for cats in the shelter that goes into a ton more detail. So if you want a deeper dive into this disease that is so important for shelters and shelter cats, I recommend you check that out. Next, we'll talk about ringworm. So first, what is ringworm? So despite the name, ringworm is actually a fungal infection of the skin. And the, the classic signs that we see are going to be hair loss and scaling, like you see in the photo there on that cat's ear. The first step to diagnosing ringworm in the shelter environment is going to be using a woods lamp uh, to screen for that. And so you can see in the second photo uh, with a woods lamp, the hair follicles, the actual infected hairs uh, are going to glow under that, that woods lamp. Transmission in the shelter is typically gonna be direct either from cat to cat or from the environment. Although it's thought that environmental transmission uh, as worried as we are about that in shelters, environmental uh, transmission is actually low. The biggest challenge when it comes to ringworm uh, is that it takes weeks to fully treat this. And so these cats do need to be isolated or in foster care, which is a great option for them uh, throughout that entire treatment period. Ringworm is a bug that is very hardy in the environment. It's hard to, to inactivate those spores. Uh, and so sanitation is gonna be really, really important. Uh, a key point that I want to mention, though, with ringworm, oftentimes shelters are afraid of, of treating ringworm in-house, and they're afraid that the environment is going to get contaminated and that, the, that other cats are going to get the disease. And, the, and a key point that I want to share is if we are using uh, some sort of topical treatment, so lime dipping is, is the most effective one, uh, if we're dipping cats, environmental contamination is actually really, really low. So assuming that we're using a treatment protocol, uh, then we're, we're actually not posing a huge risk to other animals. We still do want to take precautions, uh, but it doesn't have to be scary to either treat this in the shelter or to even treat it in foster homes. Environmental contamination, minimal if we're dipping. And I think it's key that we, as, as, as individuals working in shelters, that we destigmatize ringworm. Ringworm does not have to be and should not be a death sentence for cats in shelters. And in order to get volunteers, to get fosters to help us manage this disease, we have to destigmatize it. Uh, I have a, on the picture here, it's actually from a group room at our Utah sanctuary where cats were being treated for ringworm. And you see the staff are, are wearing personal protective equipment to prevent transmission, um, but it absolutely is a disease that we can treat in the shelter environment. What about mange? So mange in the shelter environment, and, and these are the different types of canine mange. And, and there's two that we really worry about or that we see in the shelter, and that's gonna be Demodex versus Sarcoptes or Scabies. And the important thing to distinguish between these two of them is that one of them is contagious and one is not. So Sarcoptes is contagious from animal to animal while Demodex is not. If we can, we use a skin scrape, so a microscopic identification to distinguish between the two of these. But if that's not available, or if we just need a down and dirty way to distinguish, 
then typically scabies is really, really, really itchy and Demodex is not. Now, in some cases, they can have secondary skin infections with Demodex, and so maybe they will be, uh, but that, that is one way to start to distinguish just based on clinical signs, although we do need a skin scrape to definitively diagnose. Treatment for these, uh, the isosceline class of antiparasiticides is effective against both of these. And so that's actually super useful in the shelter because we can treat them uh, for animals that are old enough. We can treat them with that and it will be effective against both kinds of, of mange. When we use those drugs, um, they, they are very rapidly effective against scabies. So they will kill those mites really rapidly. And so they are not contagious for very long after treatment. Uh, when we actually looked at this in a shelter environment, when we rechecked those skin scrapes, all those mites that were there were actually dead within 24 hours. And so presumably they're not contagious after this period. For younger puppies, uh, Revolution or a similar uh, generic product is our option. And, and for that, we actually do need more doses. This is off-label for young puppies. And so consult with a veterinarian on what which options are appropriate. But it, it is something I'm comfortable using off-label, even in puppies younger than six weeks. Next up, feline leukemia virus. And so this one is particularly important to talk about in the shelter because the risk of transmission in the shelter is actually really, really, really low in most cases. Leukemia has to be spread through ongoing close contact and it does not survive outside the cat. So unless we're group housing cats and they're having lots of ongoing social contact, uh, then they are not gonna spread this disease in the shelter setting. Uh, one thing that is an updated recommendation over the past several years is going to be not to screen healthy cats. So not combo testing healthy cats for this disease. When we test healthy cats and we get a positive result on that test, that test is more likely to be a false positive than it is to be a real positive. It means that cat is more likely to not be infected and that test is wrong than it is for that to be an actual infection. When we utilize this test as, as a diagnostic test, so say we, we have a sick cat and we are actually worried that feline leukemia might be suppressing their immune system and, and causing them to, you know, for example, not be able to clear their upper respiratory infection. When we use it as a diagnostic test, it performs much, much better. But when we're using it to screen healthy cats, we're more likely to be getting false positives than we are real positives. We could better utilize those resources for other things in the shelter than, than the actual cost of the test, the, the cost of the labor to test those cats, uh, the stress on the cats to draw that blood sample. Um, and so we, we do much better to shift those resources uh, to other things in the shelter to be able to save cats' lives than, than to screen cats for feline leukemia and, and FIV. Now let's talk about FIV. So this one is transmitted through deep bite wounds. And, and so this one also, like feline leukemia, does not survive outside the cat. And so essentially, we're not at risk of transmitting this one in the shelter either. One thing to note is that most FIV positive cats can actually live normal lives and, and they do better when they're in home environments. The risk of transmission to uninfected cats is basically zero if they're not overtly fighting with one another. And so it is okay to have FIV positive cats with negative cats. Uh, I've had an FIV positive cat in my own home, commingling, living with uh, negative cats. Uh, transmission, again, if they're not overtly fighting, uh, that transmission is, risk is going to be essentially zero. And, and if they are overtly fighting, then we have other issues that we need to deal with. All right, let's recap. So what are some of these signs of infectious disease? If you take away nothing else from our, our talk today, what are the things that you need to, to have on your radar that you're looking for in the shelter environment that, that are concerning for infectious disease? And it's all of these images here, right? It's puppies in particular that are vomiting, but vomiting can be a symptom of parvo. Uh, hair loss or um, obvious skin lesions like you see in that in that puppy in that cat paw in the photo there. Uh, ocular and nasal discharge like you see in the dog and those two little kittens on the lower right. And then certainly diarrhea, particularly if it has blood in it. With puppies and kittens, super important to look for lethargy, a decreased appetite. Any dumpy puppy or kitten is potentially contagious uh, and, until I rule out Parvo and Panluke. Uh, and certainly vomiting and diarrhea in those animals. In adults too, it includes ocular and nasal discharge, coughing and sneezing, and hair loss. Those diseases don't discriminate, and so we also need to worry about those in adults as well as puppies and kittens. Finally, let's look at a few case examples. 
So case number one, an officer picks up a young, about three month old stray puppy in the field, does a scan, doesn't find a, a microchip on that puppy, no ID on that puppy. That puppy comes into the shelter right as the shelter is closing, right as staff are wrapping up and about to leave for the day. What do we do? Well, even though it's the end of the day, we know this puppy is highly susceptible to infectious disease. And the sooner we get vaccines on board and, and maybe this puppy will start responding, the, the, the better protected he'll be. And so we need to vaccinate immediately right then. We also want to set this puppy up for getting out of the shelter as quickly as possible. Super highly adoptable puppy, right? So let's try to fast track this puppy through the shelter and get him out. Well, at the end of the next day, that puppy is not interested in food. So what are we going to do? Parvo test, right? I'm looking for any reason to parvo test. Uh, any dumpy puppy is parvo until proven otherwise. All right, case number two. So we have an adult cat that comes into the shelter as a stray. She's vaccinated on intake. Uh, she appears under socialized. And so this is a picture of her in her kennel. Uh, she's, she's trying to hide under her newspaper. The plan for this cat is gonna be, she actually gets sterilized and then returned to field. So she gets returned back out to her community. Um, what, what can we do for this cat to reduce her chances of disease? We've vaccinated her already, but what else can we do? As we talked about, one of the things that we can do for this cat in order to reduce her chance of upper respiratory infection is going to be to provide some low stress housing. So the cat in this kennel does not have a hide box. Uh, and so she is really stressed out. She's trying to hide underneath that newspaper. So one thing that we can do for her is to give her some low stress housing. Well, she develops mild clear eye discharge and some sneezing. So what, ne what do we do next with her? Well, in this situation, her chances of upper respiratory infection are increased by her time in the shelter. And so if she only has mild disease, I'm actually going to prioritize her for spay or neuter, and I'm gonna get her out of the shelter as quickly as possible, because that is going to be the number one thing that I can do to reduce that, uh, that upper respiratory disease. It's to get her out of the shelter. And so whatever we can do to make that happen faster. Case number three, so this is a four month old kitten uh, was surrendered with his litter mates. So what are we gonna do first for this kitten when it comes into the shelter? Well, we fast track, right? We try to get this kitten out, it's very vulnerable to infectious disease and also highly adoptable. And we're gonna vaccinate on intake as well as schedule those additional doses of vaccine. This kitten goes to surgery uh, and some hair loss is noted, some thinning of the hair around uh, his nose, like you see in the photo. So what do we do next? Well, we're worried about ringworm in this situation, right? So we want to handle him with caution, which we should be doing anyway with all of our pediatric animals at surgery. And we woods lamp this cat. And we get a positive woods lamp. So you can see those hair follicles are fluorescing in that photo there. And so we then, uh, we essentially have confirmed ringworm in this cat, and so we move this kitty to ringworm isolation. All right, to wrap up, this is our summary. Preventing infectious disease in the shelter is life-saving. We know that, that infectious disease can mean that animals lose their lives, and so anything that we can do to reduce disease in the shelter means that we are saving those lives. To prevent disease, we have a number of strategies and they're all important. So it's biosecurity, sanitation, it's vaccination according to shelter guidelines and, and making sure that we're storing and we're handling those vaccines appropriately. It's reducing length of stay and reducing movement in the shelter, reducing the density of animals. When disease occurs in the shelter, we need to identify it as quickly as possible and isolate those animals. Uh, and if an outbreak happens, or if, if you're worried about infectious disease in your shelter, I encourage you to ask for help. It's something that I do in my role with best friends, and there are other resources out there. So every infectious disease outbreak is, and every shelter is different. Uh, we can help you work through that. Again, most outbreaks, they're, they're not always related just to an individual animal coming in with disease, but like we talked about, there's so many other factors like the density of animals in the shelter and, and things like overcrowding or vaccination strategies, right? Uh, things like length of stay are huge contributors when we talk about disease. And so 
really, when, when I work with shelters that are struggling with disease, uh, and, and particularly are struggling with an outbreak, uh, a lot of times it can be due to these other factors. Uh, yes, an animal came in sick and spread it to the other animals, but there's also other factors at play, like capacity and crowding and staffing levels. But the, the good news is we see shelters that are challenged with, with infectious disease, and we know strategies that work to help uh, prevent outbreaks from happening, to help manage outbreaks when they do. And again, if you're struggling with infectious disease in your shelter, I encourage you to reach out to best friends, to me, to any of the shelter medicine academic programs that offer consulting. Uh, we can absolutely help you manage these diseases because at the end of the day, uh, managing infectious disease or preventing infectious disease, that is life-saving. Thank you all for attending today.